Hey, everybody, are you ready for church? So we have a special guest speaker, Jeremy Sanino, is going to be preaching. It's going to be powerful. But the way you experience it has a lot to do with how you prepare right now. Let me read a verse that connects with what he's going to preach about. And this is after Jesus says, this is what's going to happen on Judgment Day. At the very end, in uh, Matthew 25, 40, it says, The king will reply, he'll tell us, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or mine, you did for me. As you get ready for the next couple minutes, I'd like you to think about who are the least of these that God has in your life. Who do you think God wants you to reach out to that's marginalized, that maybe other people don't care about? Would you take a minute and just ask God to show you? And then ask this question, God, what shall I do? So let's get ready. Let's be prepared because God's going to do amazing things here in just a little while. You ready?
Well, good morning, Grace. Who's thankful for God's provision, just like that? This Sunday, we get to come together and take communion. We get to give thanks, to remember what Jesus has done for us. So Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So we're not only remembering and being thankful for what God has done, but what he is doing now and what he promises to do. His, he says that I will pour out my blood for the salvation of all men. All men. There's nothing we can do that can increase our chances of grace, and there's nothing we can do to stop God's grace. It's sufficient when he died on that cross. It says in Isaiah that by his stripes we're healed. That's physical healing, spiritual healing, and emotional healing. That's what God did when he died on the cross. Jesus says, I am the way, I'm the truth, and the life. He's our life. When he died and rose again, he wanted us to come with him, that we would have life eternally. And now what he's going to do, it says in Revelations 12, and then I heard a voice from heaven saying, now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. It says for the accuser of the brothers and sisters, that's us, the devil telling lies about us, for the accuser of the brothers and sisters stands before the throne of our God, accusing them day and night but this is the best part. And he was hurled down, thrown down. And it says how? By the blood of the lamb, by what Jesus accomplished on that cross, but also by the word of their testimony. That's you and I standing firm in what we know to be true. Jesus said his grace is sufficient. So we stand in that. That means it's true. Correct, church? Yeah. It says that by his stripes we're healed. We stand in that. He says it, it's true. We keep pushing on, we keep praying for healing. It says that in him we have, tr we have life, that he's our truth, and we know that to be true because he said it. There is power in saying the promises of God and knowing they are for you, knowing they're for me. They're for my son, they're for my daughter, they're for Posey. No one's outside of God's grace, and there's power in that. So right now we're gonna take communion. There's elements back here and back there. And let's just take a second to thank God for what he did, the price he paid, and what he's going to do. So sometimes we just need to have that moment where we tell someone, this is what God did for me. These are the promises that I'm holding on to because I need them, I don't see them right now. So let's just take a moment, spend time in prayer, spend time with our family, and remember the awesome work that Jesus did, the incredible miracle that he did when he died and rose for us. Hey, Grace Online, it's great to come to you again with communion as it is the first full weekend of the month here at Grace when we do communion, either whether it's in-house or it's with you online. And you know, if we, if we looked at communion, if we could summarize this, if we could capture it in one word, it would be that of remember. Can you imagine being around the table that night when Jesus was there with his disciples and he had the bread and he broke it? And he gave thanks and he passed the bread around and he was telling them that this is my body which is about to be broken and then he takes the cup and he passes the wine around and he says this is my blood which is going to be given or shed for the forgiveness of your sins could you imagine being around the table that night and then Jesus saying when you do this remember me and all those things that happen and the things that we know how how could we forget Jesus? It happens sometimes. You know what? The pace of life, the busyness, we go through certain seasons where we're maybe in a low spot. Um, and Jesus extends grace to us once more because he doesn't want us to forget. He doesn't want us to forget for what he's done for us on the cross and how he's coming back. He doesn't want us to forget that we're his kids. And so he says, when you take communion, when you do this, as often as you do it, remember me. So grateful for that grace that he extends to us. So you, as you get ready at home, the Bible says and it reminds us that on the night he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. When you do this, remember me. 
And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood that is shed for you. When you do this, remember me. So at home, as you have the chance to take the elements, remember Jesus, remember the grace that he shed for you.
Let's just do that for a second. Let's call on him. Those places that we need him. Over addiction, over depression, over our family. We serve a God that brings hope, that brings life. So let's just speak his name. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that when we cry out to you, Lord, you hear us. God, thank you for inhabiting our praises and being with us here today. Lord, and we know and I know that there's never a mistake when we come here, Lord. We're not just attending church. We're meeting with you. So, Lord, I pray that you would continue to speak to us through the message, through the word, and just being together, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us. We would know you more. God, I thank you that you bring hope, that you bring life. Jesus, that you are all that we need. Amen. He is all we need, isn't he, church? He's so good. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. Just for a moment, we're going to take a quick little break and see what is happening in grace. See what we can do, what we can be a part of. students, it's now time for you guys to head out to your small groups over at Grace Kids and Grace Youth where you're going to have fun with friends and connect with Jesus. Your small group leaders will meet you right out in the Welcome Center and they are excited to get to hang out with you today. I want to thank you guys here at Grace so much for your generosity and your faithfulness in your giving and your tithing. Your giving impacts our community and our world in so many ways for the kingdom of God. And there are a variety of ways that you can give either digitally right through the Grace Center app, our website, or if you're here in person this weekend, you can give the boxes and they are by the auditorium doors in the back as you leave. Now here's a few things that are coming up that we really wanna make sure that you know about. On April 15th and 16th will be our next baptism weekend. If you're a follower of Jesus, but you've never taken this step of obedience to declare to the world that you're a part of his family, we encourage you to sign up. You can go to the Church Center app or to Grace's events page on the website to register and let us know which service you plan on participating in baptism at. If you have a student who would like to be baptized, there's a class on Tuesday, April 4th that we ask you and your student to attend. Please sign up for that as well. Easter is now just one week out. Our Easter weekend lineup looks like this and it is a busy one. On Friday, April 7th, we have our Journey to the Cross here at this campus. This is a time where you can come and go at your convenience as you walk through some reflective stations representing Jesus' last days leading up to the cross. This event takes place right here in our main auditorium between the hours of 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. Now also on Good Friday, there's a different event that's happening, and this is an Easter outreach in Olathe. This is an outdoor version of Journey to the Cross, and it's in association with Mobile Food Relief and Love the Western Slope. This event happens at 5.30 p.m. and it's gonna be held in the Cannon Park on 5th Street in Olathe. You are both invited to attend this event, and there's an also an opportunity here for you to serve on our dream team to make this event possible. We have positions that are still available, and we would love your help with this. To sign up for those, you can do that right on the Church Center app. Now, then, when the Easter weekend comes, Easter services are going to happen Saturday, April 8th at 6 p.m., and then on Sunday, on April 9th, the services are at 8.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. There's gonna be a sunrise service in addition to that held on Sunday, April 9th, and that happens at 6 a.m. If you don't happen to have young children or you would prefer a little smaller service, we really encourage you to come to the Saturday evening service so that leaves space for families from our community who are gonna be joining us on Sunday because of those Easter egg hunts. Those Easter egg hunts, they are gonna happen between the services on that Sunday morning with the nursery and preschool hunt being at 10 a.m. and then the elementary hunt being at 10.15. So now 
repeat all of those things back to me. What's that? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 that, that's not it at all. Hey, there are so many things happening on Easter weekend. We encourage you to check those things out and keep track of those things, either by social media, the website, and those are where you can find a reminder of all of those events and times, because there's a lot going on and we don't want you to miss it. We are now in week two of our Greater Things Sermon Series, and Jeremy, our outreach pastor, now has the message for us. Good morning. Hey, you're all awake and alive. That's good. Uh, happy Palm Sunday, by the way. Uh, it's a pretty cool thing to be able to preach on Palm Sunday. I don't know if you know the whole story, but 2,000 years ago, a guy walked into Jerusalem because he had a plan to redeem us all. So how cool is it that we're celebrating that today, right? Now, I'm going to be talking about reaching the marginalized, which is what Jesus came to do, along with dying for all of us. I'm kind of excited about that. Um, let me define who these marginalized folks are that we're talking about. Uh, the dictionary says that marginalized means to relegate to an unimportant or powerless position, placed in a position of little or no importance, influence, or power. So it's the people that don't have a voice, the people that aren't heard, that are unseen, and that go by unnoticed and largely overlooked, right? Also, the way to think about it is, the margin is the spot in the book that nobody pays attention to. That's all the stuff that's around the text of the book that doesn't really make any difference other than it's there doing something and nobody really cares about it. And there's two kinds, two kinds of uh, marginalized people in the world. The first one is conditional marginalized things, where it's stuff that you can't help. Things that are just the situation that you're in, the way that you're born, like in the Bible times, Jesus reached out to the poor, or the crippled, or the blind, or the lame. Today, uh, all that stuff still applies, but it also is about race, or gender, or, or uh, religion, or um, your location, your title at work, your status in social circles, or your size. In my case, I have been marginalized by my size and a number of times. My first car was a Volkswagen Rabbit, <laughs> which uh, did not uh, lead me to be considered a cool cat in the automotive world. But it did only cost me $30, and I actually got two of them for $30. So I felt like it was a bargain. Got a lot of mileage out of that car. Um, another way, <clears throat> I was sitting at home, it's been a few months now, and uh, enjoying an entire chocolate cake to myself. And Tracy walked in and said, Hey, hon, how would you feel about uh, working out together with me? And I thought, well, that's odd. She's never asked me that before. Why would she be asking me that now? And uh, so I finished my cake and then said, Well, I would consider it. Why do you ask? And it turns out that she um, wanted to surprise me with a skydiving trip um, for Christmas. I thought, oh, that's super cool. But... Turns out there's a weight limit for skydiving. <laughs> and I was just slightly over the weight limit. And anything above 200 pounds, they charge you by the pound for that, like we're livestock or something. So I was saying, what in the world? Is, what happens? Who broke gravity up at 8,000 feet? What happens to gravity up there? Does nothing work? And my second thought was, all right, so the limit's 230 pounds. What happens at 231 pounds? Does everything just snap and you're in free fall? because that's not really a line that I would like to tow too closely, to be honest with you. But nonetheless, because I was a big person, it marginalized me. And I couldn't go up and just say, oh, I'm just going to pretend I was a part of it. And when everybody hits the ground, I'll run up and high five and say, oh my goodness, that was awesome. Do you guys remember when we jumped out of the plane? And be like, you weren't there. That's dumb. What are you talking about? Because I would have been put on the edges of that scenario. It's a silly way to think about it, but that's kind of how it is. We're all marginalized by something. And it happens still today. The second way is that we get marginalized sometimes, put on the edges and put in the surrounding area by our conduct, which is stuff like our habits or addictions, our um, political views, religion again, temperament that we've grown up with, and the way that just our isms and asms can sometimes put us out of the line of sight of people in our world, out of the line of sight of where we want to be, right? I have another example of this in my own life. You'll be glad to know. Um, about a year ago now, uh, Carl asked if I would fill in for the speaking duties at the Delta campus. 
And I said, sure, I could do that. And so put a message together and felt okay about it, but never had been to Delta before, so you know, it's all about audience participation. And I uh, was standing up there and, and started to feel a little moist in my underarms a little bit. And so they went full T-Rex and started to preach like this, you know. But uh, a couple of times I was like, yeah, let's get into it. And it's just dripping. It was nasty. Girl, you could have wrung it out. It was pretty bad. So uh, the condition that I was in, I know, and I, I look back, it was super embarrassing. And uh, I know that people noticed because I watched the video. I was like, yep, that's a pond of water in there. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> but it, I'm sure what happened is there's some people that all they could fixate on was the fact that I had a lake under each arm. And I went back and Carl asked. Carl was very sympathetic. Uh, I asked, Carl asked how it went. And I said, oh, I was all right. I just was a sweaty mess. And he looked at me and said, rookie. <laughs> Thanks so much, Carl. <laughs> But it's this conduct. So there's conditional marginalizing, stuff that we can't help, and there's conduct marginalizing, where it's the, the habits and, and things that form us and made us to who we are. But nonetheless, it sometimes puts us all on the edges, away from the place that we'd ideally like to be, and it leaves us unnoticed and overlooked. And Jesus, I did this study in the book of Luke on how Jesus treated the marginalized, And uh, there was basically boiled down to five times, five types of groups that Jesus emphasized when he reached out to people. And the first one was this. You may remember the story. Um, Jesus is at a place and all the kids run up and are gathered around him and uh, saying, Jesus, Jesus, you're super popular with the kids. And the disciples said, get the kids out of here. Jesus has more important stuff to do. Get the children away. And Jesus looks at him and says, No, let the children come to me. Let them be around me. I love the kids. In fact, not only do I love the children, they represent my kingdom. Such as the king, the kingdom belongs to such as these is what Jesus said. So he gave value to the children. The second one that Jesus did that was super cool and made a point of doing was with women. Because back in Bible times, the way that women were treated is not the same as the way they're treated now. They were valued less than men and told to be quiet and told to sit in their place and all this kind of stuff. And Jesus, two times in particular, one was where the woman at the well, what Jesus said, I got to go this way through Samaria, which was not popular at the time. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But Jesus said, I'm going to Samaria because I got to meet this woman who's coming to this well. And if you know the story, Eric talked about it a couple weeks ago, or a few weeks ago now. But Jesus sat down, sat down at the well and just ministered to this lady. And the disciples come along and like, Jesus, what are you doing? Again, the disciples don't understand what's going, along, going on because Jesus came to pull these people out of the margins. First it was the children, then it was the women. And again, when Jesus is sitting at the house of some rich people, a woman comes in and anoints his feet with oil and is drying them with, washes them with her tears and is drying them with her hair. And people are looking at Jesus like, you don't understand who this woman is. If you knew half the things that she has done, you would ask her to leave. Again, the people that thought they knew what was going on are saying, Jesus, get this person out of here. You don't understand. And Jesus is saying, are you kidding me? This is my daughter. This is part of my family. Another one, the third example, is with Jesus and lepers. And if you know anything about leprosy back in the Bible times, this was the grossest of the gross. The people, I mean, their skin would fall off Portions of their body would fall off. It was a flesh-eating disease, right? And so they were banished outside of the town, outside of the city walls, away from all of society. And one day this leper comes walking up to Jesus and says, if you've seen The Chosen, it's a really powerful scene in that series where the leper is walking up and the disciples are saying, whoa, whoa, stay away from that guy. He is unclean. That's an untouchable. Do not go near him. And what does Jesus do? walks up to him and lays his hand on it. I can just imagine the disciples saying, Jesus, what are you doing? That's disgusting. Don't you know that you're going to get sick? And Jesus says that he's moved with pity. He stretched out his hand and he touches him. So out of compassion, Jesus reaches out to somebody that you're not supposed to be around, that I'm not supposed to be around, puts his hand on him and moved with pity, he prays for him and the man is healed. And then the leper goes away completely healed and sings the praises of Christ to his other people. But the third time, again, the disciples are saying, Jesus, you don't know what you're doing. Why are you reaching out to these people? Another time he did it with the guys called the Samaritans. And we've heard a little bit about this probably, but Samaritans and Jews did not get along in Bible times. In fact, 
like uh, in the story of the woman at the well, Jesus had to go without his disciples into Samaria because they actually had a path that went around the town of Samaria. They would take extra time just to not be involved with the Samaritans. I know it's like a, almost like an opposing political view. How weird is that, right? That certainly doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> but this lawyer comes up to Jesus and asks him a question, probably feeling pretty good about himself. The lawyer says, Jesus, how do I fulfill the law? What's the most important thing? And Jesus replies back, love God and love your neighbor. And the lawyer says, great, I can handle that. I have one more question, though. He says, who's my neighbor? And I I could almost hear Jesus blink when he says, well, let me tell you who your neighbor is. And he tells the story of the Good Samaritan, which of all the people that should have helped the broken, beat-up man along the side of the road, the religious leaders of three different sects, I think, came through and decided that we'll leave this guy for the next guy. And of all the people that help him, it's the Samaritan, the one that the people that he's talking to despise. And there's two parts to this that I want you to pick up. That Jesus not only says that I'm supposed to love my enemies, is one part of it. Jesus is saying I'm supposed to love the people that I despise. But the second part is this. Jesus says, not only are you supposed to love them, but those people have value. Those people are worth loving. And the enemies that we look at and say, we've put them over here because of whatever the conditional, the conduct, however we've decided to marginalize people, not only are we supposed to love them, supposed to reach out to them, but they're worth loving. They're worth spending time on. And that's what Jesus was doing again and again and again throughout the Bible is refuting these lies and everything. And last but not least, the whole reason Jesus came was to save a world that hated him, that had wrecked it from the beginning. And Jesus came to die for the sinners of the world. Right? I want to read you uh, Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 4. It's the parable of the lost sheep. It says, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than in over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. But here's the thing with this story. I had a hard time with it because uh, as a human person, U.S. American, I look at that and say, well, 99 is pretty good odds. I mean, that's 99%. I would take that in a college class. Not that I went to college. (laughs) I went to the School of Hard Knocks, graduated with honors. Thank you very much. Yeah. (laughs) We've got graduates in here, I'm sure. (laughs) But Jesus says, I'm going to leave the 99 and go chase after the one. And I think, well, why in the world is that? I mean, it's partly because it's obvious that everybody's valuable, but the key that I came to is that Jesus looks at 99 and says, well, 99's not enough because there's one out there that's lost. And oh, by the way, I paid for 100 with my life. I paid for 100% of the people. And sometimes I go out, and you've probably had the same experience in evangelism where it seems like not only do the people not know that they're lost, the sheep don't understand that they're wandering around without a shepherd, aimless with no direction in their life, but sometimes people understand that they're lost and they just don't care. Or they understand that they're lost and they're totally fine with it. Like, I don't, it's, it's fine. I have no idea what you're talking about. It doesn't make any difference to me. But the point is not that we gauge who gets to the hear the message of Christ, who we put over in the corner and let go and look over and don't see. But the fact is that Jesus paid for a hundred of the sheep. 100% of the sheep were died for. So I don't have the privilege to decide who I put in the margins. It's not my responsibility. That, that has not been granted to me to overlook people. And it's kind of a hard truth. And it, honestly, it made me feel convicted uh, initially, sort of slid in there with a little guilt weaved in, but more convicted that I don't have the privilege of overlooking people because I'm not the one that paid the price for them. Jesus paid the price for me and he paid the price for the other 100. And he looked for me and he found me. I'm so thankful that God put a person in my life to come and find me. And we can all who've given our lives to Christ be thankful in the same way. 
that we weren't overlooked, we weren't forgotten, I, we weren't placed in the margins indefinitely. And the thing to remember is that we've all been separated from Christ, separated from God by our sins, marginalized by the things that have corrupted us in our own life, except for Jesus came and paid a price for us. We all were in the edges outside of God's story at one point. Every one of us, until we accepted Christ into our hearts. Romans 5.8 says, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Good verse to memorize. And in fact, one of those ones that when you go to talk to somebody about Christ, you should repeat it in your head. That man, while I was still a sinner, Jesus came for me. Jesus sent somebody for me. Even while I was a mess, Jesus didn't overlook me. And he had a plan in mind for me. And again, we were all on the outside, except for Jesus came and intervened for us and brought us back into relationship with Christ. And this is probably not new information for you, but it does tend to level the playing field a little bit when we go out into the highways and the byways. And when I say highways and byways, I'm not talking about going to the corner where all the druggies hanging out. I am talking about that sometimes. It's not just that, though. It's not just going to give lunches and meals to people at Shepherd's Hand, which is an awesome thing to do. But it's the people that sit next to you in your office, the people that you work with on a construction site. And it's really not hard to see these people sometimes. The ones that always are on the outside of the conversation, but yet they want to be in somehow, whatever the conversation is. The ones that feel unimportant or the new guy, or even sometimes the boss that everybody hates. That never happens, I know that. But it's tough sometimes to be a boss. And if you are a boss in here, you know how it works. It separates you a little bit. And you can feel overlooked and underappreciated. And like every time you walk into a room, everybody gets quiet. (laughs) It's not like they were talking about you. (laughs) But you know what it feels like to be marginalized. So this happens everywhere, all over the place. People feel like they're in the margins. And again, in reaching the marginalized, it's, it's everybody. And it's mostly the people that are close to you. So it's important to remember the stuff that we've been saved from, how God brought us out of the margins and back into His good grace to where we get to live a life full of Christ and full of who God has created us to be. I have another question for you. Have you ever heard um, someone say, that person would make such a great Christian? Anybody heard that before? I was thinking about that this week, um, thinking, who in the world made that up? Because uh, it's like, is, is somebody already mostly saved and just need that one little extra push? I mean, what does that even mean? Like, man, you would fit so well in our church congregation because I like the clothes that you wear, and most of the time you don't smell like a foot. You're non offensive. So I think you'd fit right in. Man, you would make a good Christian. Is it because they're nice somehow? Or they say the right things, they don't swear too terribly much. How do we push that people, those people over the edge, because I know they're pretty much Christian already, just to get them into church? And it's such a distraction to us to think that that's the kind of person I want in my church because they'd fit in so well. My goodness, where did that come from? And forgive me if that's you who says that about people. I didn't mean to offend you. I just tend to do it <laughs> sometimes. But that has nothing to do with who should be in church or who should be given the right to know about Christ. Again, I don't have the right. God did not give me the privilege of marginalizing some and overlooking some and not overlooking others, the ones that seem like they would fit in. Because again, Jesus came for all the sheep, paid a heavy price for all of the sheep. And yet people live in these blank spaces around us all the time. And I am, I am guilty of this, even as the outreach pastor. And, I, you know, I've been, I, I stand up here and, and give messages on how to reach people. I've been doing this for a whole year now. So thank you for looking at me as an expert. <laughs> it's not the case. But in my lifetime, I have experienced a lot of people who just a glance, just a notice, just a hello, just noticing the pain that they're going through, or just asking one question about how was their week, how was their life, 
Is there anything that I can do for you? Is there anything that I can pray for you? Because a lot of people live in the margins. And again, I'm sure you've experienced it yourself where people just live on the outside of what everybody else is doing. And it's not a comfortable place to be. So how do we get people out of the margins? Think about your own conversion experience too. What was it that finally brought you in to a relationship with Christ? For me, I can tell you, it was about, uh, I gave my life to Christ in about the sixth grade uh, at a Bible camp. But when I was 17, uh, my youth pastor approached me, and uh, up until that point, I was viewed kind of as a, just a joker, and nobody took me seriously, and I was all right with it. But knowing that there was something more that I could do with my life, he came up to me and said, it would be cool if you were on my leadership team and help me lead other people. And that's the difference that was made to me. Somebody came to me and said, I think you've got a little more potential than just being a goofball, which I appreciated. But that was what I had become up until that point. And somebody says, Jeremy, come up here. And there's probably people in your world that you could look at and say, I, I believe you have a little more potential than where you sit right now. And how about people just have a good experience with Christianity for a little bit? I've been saying this for a long time with our, our team, is the last thing I want to do is present the gospel of Christ. And when I say something that, that might be church-related, people immediately think, oh, I'm not religious. Man, that bugs me. I'm not religious. I'm like, well, neither am I. And I don't want to present something that might as well be Amway to people. But a relationship with Christ that brings value into their situation and brings value into who they are and who they've been created to be. So why were so many people attracted to Jesus? Well, first of all, Jesus came along and rebuked a lot of lies that had been told to people. And the Pharisees and the, the quote-unquote pastors of the day were busy telling people, if you want to be good, if you want to be saved, follow me. And watch as I give more than everybody else and pray louder prayers than everybody else and wear these robes and do all this stuff. That's how you become right with God. And Jesus comes along and is like, eh, that's not how you do it, people. And rebuke the lies. And today, those lies are still around because every good thing that, the, that God has, the devil has the opposite for it. And it's not hard to see in our day and age. And some of the lies that are being told right now are, don't worry you're not who you're supposed to be. You're not created right, but we can fix it. Just sign up in this way, and it's the craziest thing. I never thought I'd live to see the day where this is being promoted the way it is. But don't worry about it. We can change you. You can be whatever you want. You can be any gender of any kind of gender. I don't even know how many they're up to now, but there's a lot. But we can change you. Imagine the psychological damage that is going on in our schools and on our campuses right now when people are being told that you're not right, we can change you. How crazy is that? And again, every truth that the Lord has, the devil has the opposite. And we're here to tell you, on our campuses, on our, in our families, in our churches, in our supermarkets, everywhere, that God created you to be who you are. It's not by mistake that you're who you are. There's no need to live in this margin anymore, feeling like you're not who you're supposed to be. That's the lies of today. Another one is that if you have a problem, you can just medicate it. However, whatever that looks like, and it's not always chemical, you can medicate your problems away. Don't let anybody tell you that what you're doing is wrong. That's another way that people are just pushed out of the ed off to the edges and overlooked and unseen and don't bother with them. They're taking care of their problems in their own way. But it's pushing people out of God's plan, out of God's picture, and taking them away from the middle of the page. So Jesus comes along and says, in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So you Pharisee, you pauper, you peasant, balance here, <laughs> everybody has sinned. Everybody's guilty. Everybody is marginalized by something. But the truth is, I'm paying a price for you, and we're all on the same playing field here. So Jesus takes these people and restores their value, gives them value in Christ, and says, I see you, I know who you are, I've created you, and I'm proud of who you are, and I have a plan for you. That was the first thing. Second thing is this. Jesus was indiscriminate in who he sought out. 
didn't matter the race, the color, the creed, the religion, the, the gender, anything like that. Jesus would talk to anybody who was willing to listen. The sick, the captive, the broken, everyone is precious. In fact, Second Peter says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And it's straight back to the lost sheep story. Jesus is telling us over and over in the Bible, I paid the price for everybody, and I will chase after everyone. And then when Jesus leaves, He says the job is on our shoulders now to chase after anyone and everyone, anyone who's willing to listen to the Gospel of Christ. That's who I'm sending you to. And the reason is because everybody is precious to Him. I want to go through a couple stories here. Um, One about a conditional outcast and one about a conduct outcast. The first one is in Luke chapter 18. It says, As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting beside the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, so he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So two things to remember here. Number one, it's not hard to see the people that are outcast because of a condition. Well, there's some kind of an infirmity, disease, whatever it is. The way they were born, sometimes it's pretty easy to identify. But here we have the disciples again coming along and saying, don't bother Jesus. He's got more important things to do. And Jesus says, no, bother me, please. Bring the man to me. And he has pity on him, and he places his hands on him and heals his blindness. And the man goes away rejoicing. It's a pretty cool story. The thing to remember is the blind man, the beggar, who had been there for probably his whole life, knows that something is happening. Something is passing by. And so he cries out and asks for Jesus to be near, and Jesus answers him. The second story is this. One of my favorites is about the tax collector Zacchaeus. It's in Luke chapter 19. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Now, this tax collector guy, marginalized by his own contact because tax conduct because tax collectors were super duper cheaters and they had the authority and the backing of the Roman government to do whatever they wanted when they collected taxes and they took a percentage above and beyond taxes and that percentage would change all the time and so people had no choice but to pay their taxes and the tax collectors were getting rich and apparently Zacchaeus was one of the most notorious of all these people so he was hated he was despised but Jesus is walking by and Zacchaeus says i got to know that guy. That guy has something for me. And so he climbs up a tree of all things, and Jesus walks by, and of all the people he notices, like there's a guy in a tree that's desperate for me right now, so I'm going to go have dinner with him. I'm going to spend some time with Zacchaeus. And if you know the story, what happened was Zacchaeus is a changed man, and he gave half of everything he owned back to the poor. Completely changed man. But up to that point, until Jesus intervened, he was a crook hated and despised. The thing to remember in this is that the thought that people have that Jesus or the Lord or God is done with them, that they don't fit into a church, that they'll burst into flames when they walk through a church door. You've ever heard that before? <clears throat> the thought that Jesus isn't finished with them, somebody comes along and says, man, God created you to be exactly who you are and sin has corrupted you, but Jesus has a plan to redeem you. That's pretty attractive to people who have heard their whole life that I'm despised and hated and overlooked and forgotten. And the thing about all this stuff is that all these things that put us in the edges that marginalize us and get us overlooked and unseen, all that stuff happened yesterday. And it's behind us as long as we let it go. And it's behind the people that we witness to, the people that we evangelize. All that stuff happened yesterday. And people love to sit in the pit that they live in and they identify with it and it, it, makes them, it makes it easy for them to behave the way they do because no one's told them there's something else that's better. 
and it becomes just part of their persona. And I'm guilty of it. Frankly, it took a long time for me to quit being just a goofball because it was comfortable for me. You know, I might say, you gave that up? <laughs> yes, I did. It was worse. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3 says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And what it's saying is, leave the past behind you. Find out who you are in Christ. And when you speak with people at work, deliver that message to them. Say, I don't, it doesn't bother me who you've been. It doesn't bother me who you think you are. It, in fact, doesn't bother me the way that you behave sometimes. Because Christ paid a price for you. And if you're the one today, if that person is the one, I will see that person. I will notice them. And I will give them value, just like Jesus did when he was here. And sometimes, evangelism looks like we invite people to church, and it's this come and see what God is doing in our building and what God is doing in the house of the Lord, and I'm thankful for it. As look at the group of people that are here today and invite all your friends to come be here on Easter. It's a great time to invite people. But other times, evangelism in reaching the marginalized is a go and tell type of evangelism where we're supposed to get out of the box that's comfortable. And it's, you know, you expect to hear someone preach at you when you come to a church. It's a little different when you're out in the highways and byways, at your office or wherever it is, to be, to be able to uh, evangelize well and reach the marginalized. It takes a little effort. But nonetheless, Jesus says in Luke, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. So sometimes Jesus just went. He said, we've got to go to a different town. And there's a couple of ways, practical ways, that we're going to do this this week. One of them is the Easter event in Olathe. And if you haven't been part of one of our outreach events <clears throat> just yet, they're pretty fun. And it's an easy way for you to reach out and look out and see somebody who might have been overlooked. And that's really all we ask you to do. If you show up on Friday, just be watching for somebody who might need you to say hello. Just to have a good experience with the gospel of Christ. And I'm not saying you're going to throw Bibles at them and Kung Fu Christianity if they don't get saved, it's a failure. But how about people have a good experience with Christianity for a while and get some groceries yeah. and get sent home with a full belly and told that God loves them? Another one is this. You guys remember Camp 210? About a billion and a half kids that run around here in the summertime. It used to be called VBS, but it's Camp 210. Well, we're not doing that anymore here. Um, we're actually using uh, this Camp 210 as an outreach opportunity. So it's going to be partnered with um, Grace Kids here, Grace Kids in Delta, and our outreach team. And we're going to take the whole program out to Olathe. So there's been a burden for Olathe put on the hearts of the leadership here at church. So that's what those flyers on your um, chairs were for, that if you want to be a part of that, reaching out to young people, what Jesus said, bring the little kids in, that's what we're going to do. And there's also a, I don't know if you know this, there's been a Spanish church here at Grace for a long time. They meet over in the Grace Kids at 2.30 on Sundays. And I've been wondering up until about eight weeks ago, where do I send the Spanish people that want to know about a relationship with Christ? Well, lo and behold, we have a Spanish pastor here at Grace. I'm super thankful for it. So we have a place to send those people who are, quite frankly, marginalized by the race, marginalized by their culture. And I love the Spanish people, but it's different, and I don't understand it. I'm not part of that culture. As much as I would like to understand, it's just different. But we have people that understand and want to minister. And Carl was asking me, how do we reach the Hispanic community? And I was like, well, first thing, you find somebody else to do it than me. Well, we have that person. We have that team here. It's the coolest thing. So I'm going to finish up with this. What does this look like on Monday? When we go back to work on Monday, what does it look like to reach the marginalized? <clears throat> One last story. In Luke chapter 15, the story of a woman who loses one coin out of 10. Here we go with this 90 percentile again. She has 10 coins and she loses one and she turns her house over to find it. And Jesus is telling this story 
again, because everyone is valuable. But the thing about a lost coin, the thing about somebody who doesn't know Christ, is that they're not used by Christ until they come back into the, into the flock. Lost coins don't have value, can't be spent, aren't worth anything when they're sitting underneath a dresser or sitting underneath the couch. But you know when you dig in your couch and you find, hey, I have enough money to take my whole family to dinner. Apparently my pockets are broken. But when you find that money, you can spend it again. And it's the same way with people. When you find the one person who might be ready to know Christ, you find that person who's ready, who's like, Jesus is walking by me right now. Jesus is close by and they're ready to reach out. All that value that God created in them can be back, can be given back to them. And they can be used by the Lord for their intended purpose. And we can beat the lies that the world is telling them by saying that God has created you to be someone special and God has a plan for you. So that's what Monday looks like. And I'm going to say a quick prayer. We have one more song to finish with, but I want to pray for you. As you, I, I appreciate your prayers for outreach, by the way. But let's pray really quickly because God, we want to be a church that reaches you. And your word says that we have not because we ask not. So God, we're asking that you would work in and through us to see the people that are on the edges that are overlooked and unseen because God, I know you see them. And Jesus, I know you died for them. And God, I also ask that you would help us to believe that you're working through us and believe for salvations and believe for miracles that would happen. The greatest miracle of all, Lord, is that you came and you died and you paid a price for us. And so God, I thank you for how you're going to work in us. And pray this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen.
is just one more thing I have to ask you. Um, you, you might kind of recognize, at least it seems this way to me, that it seems like Jesus is approaching our area at this time, right? There, there was a whole series on revival, and I don't know what that looks like, but it seems like Jesus is kind of walking by at this point and reaching out his hand and looking for people. And if that's you, if you're here and you don't know Christ, today's your day. Reach out your hand because Jesus sees you. Jesus knows you. Jesus wants to be a part of your life. And the second thing is this. We want to pray for you, but if you want to reach people and you want prayer for that, come up to the front. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to be a part of the story where you're, you're having a testimony about how many people are coming to Christ. I mean, how cool would that be? Personal revival in people's lives, right? Otherwise, go and make sure you invite the entire phone book to church next week. Bring all your friends, all your family. It's going to be a great service. So thank you. Thank you guys so much for joining us this weekend at Grace Online. We'll see you next week at the same time, same place. And just a reminder, you can follow us through all of our social platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also register online through the Church Center app for any upcoming events or small groups. You can also give through the Church Center app or online through Grace's website. You are some of the most generous people we know, and we celebrate what God is doing through your faithfulness in this way. Have a great week.